During my visit to Nairobi, I met a lot of people who asked me who I would be interviewing during my stay there. I was pleasantly surprised by the number of people who could not believe my luck when I told them that Janet was one of the people that I would be interviewing. Janet is not only a well-respected media personality, she is also an advocate for gender equality. She focuses her career on menstrual equality. Janet is also the founder of Inua Dada Foundation. And what that foundation does is create a supportive and accessible environment for women and schoolgirls in Nairobi. Janet's accomplishments don't only end there. She's also the author of a book called My First Time, which is a collection of stories from women and men about their first interaction and experience with menstruation. If uh, this is the kind of stuff that interests you, I want to encourage you to listen into this conversation. Make sure you don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, as well as hit the notification bell so that you don't miss any videos that we upload. Hello, Arjuna Women Tribe, and welcome to another episode of Working Smart and Living Well with myself, Nomdeni. I am so thrilled to be in Nairobi. Yes. I was saying to someone, I'm just so overwhelmed by like the warmth of the people here. Yeah. I, I almost feel a little aggressive because everyone <laughs> is just so calm. And I'm just like, okay, don't yeah. you take it down a little bit. You don't have to fight anyone <laughs> you here. You can take it down a you notch, it's fine. You can take it down 10 <laughs> notches, actually. So what a beautiful city. It really is. Generally, I think city. Kenyans are... I think we're generally warm people. I know a lot of people who come from outside, but I was just telling you earlier, we've been through the most. Yeah. So sometimes when people snap, I'm like, no, they're generally nice. They've just been through the most. No, I've been so lucky. I've only yeah. met really nice, even yeah. like at the, the hotel I'm, I'm staying at, like yeah. at reception, they, they, are you okay? Yeah. Did you enjoy your sleep? Is there anything we can help you? I was like, hey, listen, I might just move to Kenya. You need to come back listen, more Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're welcome. You are that so is welcome. Done. That one is done. Yeah. Janet, I am so thrilled to be having this conversation with you. Yeah. I looked at your bio, I looked at, like, there's a section where it's like accomplishments and I'm just like, <laughs> what have you not accomplished? What is oh, it that you have not done? Oh, thank you. And you have such a warm energy. You know, sometimes you. when you look at people's bios, the actual bio itself can be so intimidating. Yeah. But you have been such a, you know, I, I feel like you're like my girlfriend in Nairobi Oh, now. thank you. Yeah, you also give off really good energy. I think you make people just feel like they're having an easy oh, conversation. Thank so, And thank you for that. I should add something in my bio, <laughs> like, I'm actually a warm person. I should put a disclaimer I there. I have good energy. I have good energy. Yes, I've achieved a lot, but, but don't worry about energy. that. Oh, really, man. it's such an honor to, to yeah. have this conversation with you. Thank you. I, um, I'm really curious about how you end up being the Janet that you are today, you know, and all the accolades that you've achieved and everything that you have done. Out of everything that you do, which one is your first love? Wow, that is a good question. That's a really good question. I would have to say, ah, wow, Nomdeni. <laughs> like, she <laughs> just, like went, she just went in with the depth. I'm like, let's talk about the weather. Oh <laughs> and then easy. Oh, but that's a brilliant. No icebreakers here. <laughs> no. We're going into it. I don't, I think at the base of it, and you'll let me know if I've answered it correctly. I know that I'm really passionate about storytelling mm. because it kind of cuts across everything I do. So whether it's in the advocacy I do or the media work I do, it's storytelling. But my first love has to be my original first love, which was radio, which is in its own a first uh, form of storytelling, mm. um, or maybe more than that, television. It's funny because I keep getting asked, are you ever going to go back? I'm like, probably someday because it is something I loved. Mm. I stepped away for whatever reasons. But again, it's a medium for storytelling. Yes. So at the base of it, it's storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, TV, because it's like my first job. And it also led me to my current love, which is social justice and advocacy through the mm. work at my foundation, which also has storytelling. Absolutely. So probably at the base is storytelling. The medium is probably TV. It's so weird because I did a strengths finder and my number one strength is storytelling. Wow, which is what you, and you do it really well, even through the summit and through the work you do. It's so crazy because yeah. I never quite thought about it that way. I mean, I know the things that I absolutely love doing. I love having conversations. Yeah. I love discovering people, who they are, where they come from, what mm. motivates them, what inspires them. Yeah. So I guess I am doing it to some degree. You're a storyteller. Absolutely love it. Yeah. How much of your environment do you believe has shaped who you are? What did you want to be when, when you were growing up? Um... 
for some reason, at some point, I really wanted to be a psychologist. And I do feel at some point I do want to combine that because it's all about the mind and behavior. Yeah. And the work I do now around um, advocacy or activism has a lot to do with how people view the world and view different gender roles. So psychology was actually what I wanted to do. And it took my former business studies teacher in high school to say, I think you need to do media. Mm. And I was 17. And she sat me down in her office for like 45 minutes to an hour. And she said, I've watched you debating on stage in school because mm. I would do debate club and all of these. She said, I've seen you do verse speaking, which was the poetry club. And she said, I think you have a knack for media. And I oh, haven't wow. really thought about it. Maybe at the back of my mind watching um, women read the news and that kind of thing. I didn't, but I didn't really think that was attainable. Yes. So she planted the seed um, and then thankfully where I grew up and how I grew up with my parents, my dad was very much around, do whatever you do, just do it well. Oh, I, I wasn't that. limited to you have to do this. It was, do you want to do a, you want to be an engineer? Do you want to be a, a singer, somebody who goes to space? Just do it well. So it allowed me to kind of dream and open my mind and when the opportunity for media came, I wasn't limited to, I can't do it. It was mm. actually, no, you can't just do it well. So I do think my environment at school, in high school and at home, shaped the ability for me to allow myself to be. I love and that. to plug into what I feel I was passionate about without limiting, oh, I'm a woman, I, I don't look the part or whatever it is. So in many ways, I think so. And I, I recognize that that's a huge privilege because I feel like it's the exception, not the norm. Yeah. A lot of people are told you can't, but that was a huge privilege that I had. I really love that idea of do anything you want to do, but do it really well. Just do it well. I think that's really powerful. In, yeah. in especially, you know, I'm a parent of teenagers yeah. and they're right at the age where they are thinking about what do they want to do for the rest of their lives. And it's so weird because when I was growing up, I, would, I, I just felt like, People must just allow people to do whatever it is that they want to do. But I think when you become a parent, there's <laughs> yes. so many things that factor into it. I think about their ability to sustain themselves financially. What is the best possible yeah. option? And if they give me a career where I'm just like, oh my gosh, you're going to struggle. And then you want to, I start to panic. Yeah. So I really love the idea of shaping people, uh, particularly young people, mm -hmm. to have this uh, mentality of whatever it is that you do, just do it well. I like that. And what you've said, though, is so valid because you know, as a parent, mm. whenever you, when you become a parent, something switches. You're like, Absolutely. you're like, are you sure you want to do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I'm like, I can't believe I'm this person. And I was the one, I had a friend, I was having um, a discussion with her the other day and her son is now much older, but he one day told her, I want to do football. And she's like, what do you mean you want to do yeah. football? She said, play it in your spare time. Yes. And he went to you, no, eventually he told her I really want to, then he gave her a plan now mm. when he was in his late oh, teens. Wow. And now he has two degrees in football football, I think coaching, and he also does data analytics. Oh, wow. But, you know, so she told me, she, again, was much like you. She mm. said, I had always thought my children can do anything until yes. he told me he wants to do football. <laughs> then I was like, in whose home? Yes, yes. So it is very daunting. Mm. Um, so it's almost like if you do want to do something that's a little bit off, off script or off yeah. the cuff, maybe it's to find out what opportunities are there in that mm. space. And then if there really aren't, it's to try to be like, do you want to maybe... <laughs> Maybe can go this just, way. Can we <laughs> yeah. get a business degree and then you can do that? But it's a very valid, design. it's a very valid concern. When you, you mentioned earlier that uh, you are not so present in the media space anymore and you have this focus on your foundation now, what inspired the transition? And were you not scared? Uh, I think also, I just want to contextualize that. I think also when you've done particularly well in, mm -hmm. in one area, uh, transitioning is, is difficult. It almost feels like you're studying again. That's true. That's really true. Was it scary? Yes, it was. It's interesting because I think I left TV. At that time, I had a certain reason. And then in hindsight, I realized exactly why I did it, which was, I think, there was so much happening in my life that I didn't realize was affecting me mm. and affected my decision to step back. Because yeah, even my bosses were like, what do you mean you want yes. to? And I told them, and I still hold it. I say, this is not goodbye. This is see you later. Yeah. Because I said, I think I'll always come back to it because it's not, I'm not done. Mm. Because I kind of left a little suddenly. But I took six months to process before I resigned on air. Yeah. So I'd already talked about it with my family. I'd already kind of mapped out what I'll do, but I was still very scared because mm. I'd only known that for 10 years. I literally was a news anchor for 10 years straight. Oh, wow. Um, and on the 10th year is when I said, I need a break for various reasons. Some were personal, but some were, I wanted to really invest in my foundation. Yeah. Now what inspired my foundation was again through media. Mm. I, did a, I used to host a, a show every Monday called Monday Special. It was like a talk show. 
about social impact and social issues, whether mm. it was from health to social. And this one story changed my life. It was called uh, Periods of Shame. Oh. And Periods of Shame showed two girls in Marigat, which is in Baringo County in Kenya. They were using chicken feathers and goat hide because they didn't have sanitary towels. And I think it shook me to the core because I couldn't believe that that was happening. So first of all, it was a big deal to have a story like that on primetime news on the most watched station in the region. And why was that? My, the, COO, the COO at the time bulldozed and she said, I want this story to run. Everyone in the newsroom was like, you're gonna talk about periods on air? So there was just the stigma around periods, number one. Number two, it's primetime news, mm. which is viewed a lot by, you know, whether it's men or whatever yes. it is, older yes. men, women. Yes. So it was a very big disruption but it actually changed the landscape of menstrual justice in the country because mm. suddenly a policy started being developed, more money was allocated. That's why I love storytelling because yeah. it can literally shift something. So that introduced me. I was so triggered by that story. The country was outraged. It trended on Twitter for like two days straight. I told my boss, we need to do something. She's like, my God, you've been at my office for two days. You figure out what to do. Mm. So that's when I came up with Inua Dada, which is a Plifter sister. And it was really to raise enough sanitary towels for the girls, but also to lobby for a bigger budgetary allocation. And then it never left me. Oh. So that's how I, the initiative then became my foundation. Like the station literally handed it over to me because I wouldn't shut up. They're like, you're at our door every day. Here, <laughs> we've signed it over, go register it. And that's where I found myself. And then I, it's been, a, it's been almost, gosh, it's been almost 10 years now. And then through that, you begin to learn so much about the different intersectionalities mm. with gender-based violence, economic empowerment. And so it never left me. And it just kept me hungry for impact on a policy level and impact on an intervention level. Mm. So really, I was introduced to social justice through my work as a journalist. Because oh, wow. you, you come across so many stories, right? Yeah. Good or bad. But that stayed with me. Because I was like, I get my period every month and I don't care about, I just go grab a you know, packet off the shelf and you mean there's, at the time, I was like, there's two million girls who don't go to class because of this? Uh, I was forever changed. Oh, wow. So that's what led me to doing it. It's so crazy to hear such stories, especially when you have the privilege of navigating your period without half of these challenges and thinking about yeah. all of this. Did you ever work with those girls? Did you ever meet them uh, uh, again? I did, because when we, because that story I think came out sometime in August, if I'm not mistaken, of 2013. So it actually has been 10 years. And then, sorry, I'm belching. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know where that's from. It's not like I've eaten much. <laughs> TMI, sorry, let me focus. <laughs> this is being edited. Um, so what happened is the initiative grew so much, I think because the station was sweet enough to be like, you can run the initiative on TV and get people to donate. Oh, wow, that's amazing. It was so amazing. Oh, they were amazing allies. So the first lady's office got interested. And so we decided, why don't we take sanitary towels to that region, meet the girls, meet her peers, donate, do a little bit of an event and, you know, kind of mark that moment. So mm. we did go to Marigat in November of 2013. The then first lady, who just started her term at that time, she came. So it was quite a big event because then the members of parliament from there were there. Some of our fellow news anchors were there. So it was a pretty big event. And then we met the girls, didn't interact much with them. But the social worker who brought that uh, to attention for me was the biggest hero. So she, we even insisted that she say something yeah. in front of the first lady. Because if it wasn't for her, we would not have known. Yeah. She's the one who said, this story needs to make it. And through her own channel, she found it to Citizen TV at the time. Mm. And so... Um, met the girls, met their peers, donated, talked to them. But it also showed me that this was just scratching the surface. Because yeah. I'll never forget some of the girls holding a packet and not knowing what to do with it because they'd never seen a pad before. Oh, wow. And so when we all went home, I was still disturbed. Yeah. And I woke up the next day and I called Beatrice. The, 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 she's a social worker and teacher. I'm like, Beatrice, what do we need to do? She said, this just has to be ongoing. Yeah. I was like, I feel so bad. Are the girls okay? She's like, some of them have no idea what a pad is. Mm. I had to teach them how to wear a pad, you know. Yeah. So. Um, so in that sense, it was the allyship really helped and we met the girls, but we also met a wider community um, of girls who were going through the same thing. You touched on something that immediately comes to mind when I, I, I'm always interacting with people or content around period poverty, mm -hmm. you know, as, as the term has been coined now. The, 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 the challenge of 
how do you become impactful in this area? There's always a new girl that's born. Periods are, a con every single month a girl is having a period. The capacity in terms of the, 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 the problem. Yeah. Um, and, and, and my question is gonna be twofold because the first one is for the people, because I'm seeing a lot of these initiatives coming mm. up everywhere, but I'm also seeing people lose steam because yeah. how do you sustain uh, providing pads for girls when there's also pink text, you yes. know? So yes. it's not a cheap <laughs> exercise. Yeah. Uh, that's number one. And number two, for the people who are invested in, in this conversation and studying foundations, how do you then sustain even the foundation itself? That's a really good question. And I love it because those are the questions we all need to be asking ourselves, yeah. you know, because sometimes I think people go into it because it's, um, they mean well, but it's mm. also because it's on trend. Mm. And I'm like, this is not a trend. This is not a vibe. This is actually, you know, real life. But I think the sustainability comes in one or two ways. Number one, governments need to integrate menstrual health and sexual reproductive health and rights as like a national agenda. Mm. It needs to be integrated as a developmental agenda, meaning that you don't silo it to say, oh, there's that periods thing. It's to say sexual reproductive health and rights needs to be a core part of our programming from the time that children are young, mm. boys and girls, meaning that we put more resourcing behind advocacy, more resourcing behind um, communications and impact and empowerment. Then on the other hand, which is probably a bit more complex, even though some countries like Scotland have achieved it, is making these products as available to the point where they're even free. Yeah. Now I say it's complex, obviously, because it comes down to whether it's the GDP or whatever it is that needs to be thought about. But ultimately, if you don't do that, period poverty will continue to exist. And Scotland had to sit down and look at all the parameters, look at how much productivity was being lost out in the workplace, look at how many girls were missing out of school and how that was essentially affecting lives. Mm. And then they made the decision and said, we're going to actually make these products available to everyone who menstruates. Yeah. It's bold, it's new, so we also have to kind of see how that plays out. But if we don't have a developmental agenda and a policy that says we need to provide we need to provide through creating, making sure that the government is resourcing or collaborating enough to provide and sustain. Right now, it's very lukewarm. Mm. Menstrual Hygiene Day, everyone in the world is like, yes, we need more. Yeah. But it has to be such an intentional, consistent agenda. Um, and then we need to look at everything from choice of products, quality, what it takes to produce. Can we talk to the manufacturers? Can the government um, be able to take some of this on as their initiative because if the government doesn't take it on it remains with all partners and then it becomes unsustainable yeah if the government says we're actually providing a policy and a resource um a, an amount of resource and allocation to sustain the distribution of these products then you begin to make headway mm. but right now it hasn't really been integrated as a developmental agenda it's mm. been left to a lot of cso's it's been left to girls and women to figure it out it's been left to the likes of myself and all the other incredible menstrual champions and yet you can tell by being on the ground what needs to happen yeah. and by other, what other countries are doing. So we still have a long way to go, but we can achieve it. We just need the goodwill to say, we're going to resource this. We're going to mm. make sure that there's enough that goes into research, that goes into um, sustaining these projects, that goes into creating um, advocacy and communication, even, even with the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. Let's integrate it as a communications tool, even from school. Yeah. But it has to be owned a lot by the government, and then they collaborate with partners. I can't say they've done badly. I know we had a, the Basic Education Act in 2017. There was a part there that said, pads need to be free for every girl in public school. And for a moment, there was distribution for three months. Yeah. And they're like, so what must I do on the fourth month? Because my period is still going to come. Still going to come. So there was that goodwill of like, let's have this in the law. Let's make sure that girls are. But again, to your point, how long are you going to sustain that? Absolutely. If you're still, to your point, having things like pink tax, the tax was lifted in 2010. It didn't reflect in the products. We were the first country in the world to lift tax off period products, Kenya. We're like the poster child for policies, by the way. Ah. We have the best policies. Mm. Ask about implementation. And, and where's the mm. challenge with implementation? I'm, I'm going to, I had Very another good. question. Because, okay. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, 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 in, in, in particularly work that has to do with um, gender specific challenges, mm -hmm. I find that when I have conversations with people, they are not at the forefront. They don't seem. Um, it's not it's not big enough of a problem yeah. particularly when you think about some of the challenges that 
African governments are facing. Mm. You know, you start with the basic one, just poverty. Yeah. Just feeding a person mm. who, who is in the continent and, and does not have the ability to um, create revenue that allows them to, to live well, mm -hmm. you know. And then you stack that up with, in, in, in certain countries, whether that is in the States or in South Africa, then there's, there's race issues, you know. How do we get more black people in specific areas? Mm -hmm. and, and it always feels to me that these gender-specific mm -hmm. dilemmas and challenges take a back seat, yeah. um, you know, when, when, when people start to stack it up that way. So first question, um, what are the challenges when it comes to implementation that you have seen? Mm -hmm. um, that's number one, off the context of what I just shared. And then number two, I want to better understand when you uh, engage with different people in, 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 in this particular space, what is the state of Kenya if this is not addressed? Because I think yeah. that perspective mm -hmm. starts to illuminate the urgency of some of these issues being addressed. You know why your second question is so important, if, if you don't mind me starting with that? Sure. Is that right now, actually, the latest push or part of a conversation series I'll, I'll be starting soon in collaboration with an organization based out of Sweden, but um, very much allies. Like mm. she's not about, she's like, I don't even want to be known that we're doing it. It's just that we feel it's important. Is that now they're trying to put um, the focus on what you've just said. How does it affect the bigger issues? Because one of the major issues that's been a problem with menstrual justice or sexual reproductive health and rights is there's not enough research. Mm. So if there's no research and data, people will be like, ah, then maybe it's not a, they don't it's see the thing. magnitude of the issue. Yes. It's been so poorly researched. I think the only major research that was done was with the Kulchik Foundation. She's Dominika Kulchik. She's this really wealthy Polish philanthropist mm. who kind of commissioned research back in 2020 and then was able to kind of pick up on some of the data, but it's so ad hoc. Um, even though agencies, whether it's like UNFPA and all, have some of this data, it's just not as deeply researched. Yeah. So right now, the, d the data doesn't also integrate how it affects other spaces. You can see it. You can see things like absenteeism. You can see things like violence in the home because of ETC. But it hasn't been deeply, as deeply researched. And so this new push uh, for the next few years is they're trying to angle the conversation on can we resource research mm. to get the data and then can we also um, resource interventions yeah so it's really great that you've asked that question because that's kind of the angle this collaboration is trying to take so it hasn't started yet but we've already had those kind of preliminary conversations because mm. again she was saying the same thing like for how long will we make noise yes we need we need the numbers so yes. that the numbers can show people this is what happens to a country. Yeah. You know, this is how, and it shouldn't even be about the bottom line, but it's okay. Let's, let's yeah. give you the outlook yeah, I mean, of the I, bottom I, line. I, and, and I think when you think about institutions, we live in yes. a capitalistic world, yeah. right? People are always moved by yeah. what am I losing yes. if I don't solve this problem? Yeah. So if I don't park the car yeah. in the garage and it gets dented, then I have to pay for insurance to get it fixed. So I yeah. think that's the psychology of people a lot of times. I see it so often uh, when I speak to um, particularly men in powerful positions and not because they don't want to help mm -hmm. because in a way that's how their their thought processes exactly. are conditioned so to get stuff done you kind of need to contextualize it on the basis of if this girl does not have uh, you know sanitary pads yeah this is how many girls are dropping off from school exactly. this is the problem that the government is gonna have to face with people who are unemployed yeah that's gonna affect them you know it's kind of that's the narrative oh, yeah. that I think um, becomes yeah. um, Needs to be front and center. It needs to be front and yeah. center, but it also grabs the attention of, 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 of leaders. It's the same way, I believe that there was some research that said we spend in Kenya 46 um, billion. And I say that they're like, no, Janet, I'll check. You'll strap it. But I think it's 46 billion shillings is spent um, on gender-based violence in Kenya. That's on everything from... Um, um, basically as a result of whether mm. it's medical issues whether it's justice whether it's so imagine if you had preventative measures you'd be saving this much money yeah so you see it on something else there you go so we almost need a similar approach which is because girls and women don't have access to sanitary towels they drop out of school there's been a lot of sex for pads which leads to teen pregnancy then you have a whole other issue around the burden of 
teen pregnancy, mm. uh, child protection, crime. So we can see, we know the landscape because we're on the ground, but to your point, we need to now give it meat. Yeah. We need to really do a deep dive into the meat. So it just needs to have that backing. And if there is, and somebody comes up in this comment section and says, hey, listen, there's this data, fine, but we need a really global centralized push yes. and data from different countries. Yes. So I would say that is, I think, the main reason why it hasn't been it's almost looked at as a trend or that woman's issue, but it's yeah. not, it's bigger than that. Period poverty costs families, it costs women safety and girls. Yeah. In terms of the implementation, there's not enough coordination. There's not enough coordination or direction in terms of implementation. So we launched the menstrual health policy in 2020. I remember it was smack in the middle of COVID. And then everyone's like, okay, so then who does what? Yeah. I'm like, you didn't think of that when you were launching. So coordinating bodies or committees, and I know we like things like Kenya likes this word task force. Oh, okay. <laughs> so very, <laughs> when you hear task force, you're like, oh my God, then we go with another task force. And then the task force is sometimes uh, rife with corruption, but that's what it needs. It literally needs a coordinating body um, and a lot of these policies. They just need commitment. They need yeah. follow through and they need the government to support. So the government, like I said, the former president did his thing. Mm. He said, He's committing 2.6 billion shillings or you know 2.3 million dollars to fight gender-based violence they're going to have a survivors fund they're going to have safe houses but that's goodwill and the rest is like you guys need to figure out how you're going to make this i've done my bit yes but then it's still you sign it but then there needs to be even government assisted coordination in terms of this is the way we'll do it mm. so that's lacking and that's also what I was talking about, you know, moments ago with, with, with a group of people is that there's just not enough coordination, even access to justice. Mm. I moderated a, a session on that last year and it had people from the judiciary. It had people from, you know, um, lawyers and everything. And all of them were saying the same thing. There's no coordination. Oh, wow. It's not well coordinated. So you have a victim who comes in and says, I've been molested, I've been raped. And then first there might be re-traumatization. What were you wearing? What were you doing? Mm. Number one. So they're not trained. Number two, you're told, go there, fill this form. They go there, they're told, the form is not here, it's this. You get t by the time it's three hours, you're like, what are you guys doing to yeah. me? Then by the time you have a case, it's delayed for three, even three years, a year, mm. because, the ju because it wasn't in the docket. So now there's the first SGBV court in Shanzu in Mombasa. It's the first of its kind in Kenya, which is great, mm. but it's under-resourced and understaffed. So the problems just keep coming up. So there's no coordination, the files get lost, who was manning that file? I don't know. I thought you were manning the mm. file. Guys, you know. And then the, the behavior change. Nomdeni, it starts with here. Yeah. A lot of people have socially normalized issues that affect certain people. I'm so glad you brought that up. They're just like, but you must just suck it up like other people do. Mm. It's not that much. Like, go home, figure it out. So it has to start there. Let's start with talking as men and women. There are men who are also looking for safe spaces, but they feel emasculated about yes. saying it. They're like, I'm dealing with a violent woman. Yeah. Where, where do I go? Yes. Um, but they wouldn't say that. Or so sometimes when they hear us saying, save women, you'll hear a lot of pushback of what about men? Yes. I'm like, but it's not what about. It's like, and what about, and let's talk about all of us. Yeah. So we need to create the spaces, the safety, the conversations, the dialogue. There's so much screaming and shouting happening right now. Mm. Everyone is screaming at each other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it affects all facets of life. It even affects implementation. Because somebody who's sitting up there will be like, you guys are so skewed. We shouldn't let this go through yeah. until you integrate this and this thing. So it's such a, this thing is long game. It is long game and it's... How do you stay inspired? And, and I mean, I had a long list of questions <laughs> for you, but I'm, I, I'm literally, yeah. I think about this so often and I don't talk about it enough. I'm going to be very honest yeah. that I don't talk about it enough. And one of the reasons I don't talk about it enough is because I'm such a solution driven person. Yeah. I literally get to the end of the thought process and I think, what what happens now? Yeah. You know, how do you stay motivated to... to how do you keep motivated to stay the cause? And another reason I ask this is because around 2019, the World Economic uh, mm. Forum published uh, a, a, a study that spoke about how at the pace that we are addressing gender e equality, we are going to take about 230 years to, to, to reach there. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I started Agenda Woman, although it wasn't really about uh, gender equality, what I wanted was to empower women economically more than anything, yes. right? It was about how do you create an environment, communities, content that helps women better navigate some of the challenges that they're helping that prevent that from mm -hmm. happening. 
But I also had to uh, make peace with the fact that the, a, a, an idea of a society where women are economically empowered, I might never see in my lifetime. Because mm. I, I had to make that peace. Right. I had to get into the job and know that I will not see the results of what I'm trying to build. But I can start and maybe someone else will take over. I want to know for you, because I mean, my job, I feel like is fun. You know, I'm <laughs> in the fun part of things. I, I get to talk to people. I get to do what I love. But you're in the crux of really seeing the effects of Mm -hmm. Some of these policies not being present, not being implemented, uh, the effects of people not wanting to listen to each other, everyone wanting their their, their moment in the sun. Mm -hmm. How do you stay motivated to stay? To, 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 how mm -hmm. do you keep motivated to stay the cause? Wow. First of all, I, I love that you have a focus on economic empowerment. Yeah. Because I, I think that's one of the biggest drivers of, um, of safety, of the mm -hmm. safety of, of women. And I we do try to drive economic empowerment programs where we are because all the women we work with at my center are all survivors of violence and a lot of them couldn't leave because of yeah. you know not having the economic power but also to allow them to scale and to dream and to think yes so i love that you do that because it means it's about women thriving mm. so power to you sis <laughs> how do i stay motivated i've asked myself that every day sometimes i'm like should i just I should just go get another endorsement for brands, yeah. <laughs> you know. But I think I stay motivated because I've seen the steps. I've seen the progress. I've seen the progress over the last decade. Even though they've been small wins, they've been wins that have opened a door for somebody to do something. Yeah. So I think I stay motivated also because I realize this is a long haul. Um, I made peace with the fact that you're not going to see the results tomorrow. You have to. And so I've, I've completely said, I am invested in this for the rest of my life. Yeah. But it's also because I've seen that. 10 years ago, there was no policy, for example. 10 years ago, you wouldn't be in a room full of men and women or see something on national TV that says we're commemorating this day and there's a panel live on air saying, how do we get to the That never happened. It was banned or it was frowned upon. Mm. Those are the ways that I'm seeing minds, mindsets shifting, attitudes shifting. So I'm like, there is progress. In some of the more underserved communities in the country, um, there's been a huge issue with teen pregnancies at the hands of border border riders, the, the men on the bikes. Because, oh. you know, they've got quick money. Mm. And so they have, you know, communities have outrightly said, these are the ones who are mostly making our girls pregnant. Mm. And then to see some of them form an association saying we're going to check our guys that it. they don't do that. That's progress. I love it. And I didn't see that years ago. And so you go talk to them because I go there and I talk to them and one of them is like, we've had we've had to arrest drivers and take their bike and their license because they're predators mm. so things like that keep me motivated i'm like okay some people are starting to get it if we have more of him you know mm. um who knows what it means to have a safe environment then that means he can then influence his other peers and colleagues and he's a man and he's a male leader so they look up to him and be like, he's our guy Absolutely. and we follow. Even people who drive uh, Matatu's taxis in yes. SA, right? Yes. Um, same thing we've had. So we see that and I say, there's actually progress. Sometimes even my sons show me this progress because kids today have a lot of agency, mm. unprovoked. I don't know, it's yes. like they're born with it. Yes. And so Which when is beautiful. It's so beautiful. They're the, they're the ones who are going to fix this world. <laughs> but when I hear him say that's not right, I'm yeah. like, good. This gives me hope that stand with what's right you know mm. so so the the pockets of progress inspire me um even though sometimes the reality can be so heartbreaking yeah but the progress the pockets of progress or even seeing velma who's at our center seeing her working gives me joy every day because i know where she came from yeah. and sometimes in the middle of work when we're talking she'll just cry and she'll yeah. be like you saved my life yeah. this program saved my life because i was going so that gives that keeps me going yeah. the the heartbreak is just scaling it and getting people to say that by the way storytelling and advocacy needs to be funded because it makes a difference it makes a case for progress yeah. and people not really understanding so those are the things that you need to kind of um tell people to think differently. Yeah. I'm like, you also need to resource the documenting programs like this, yeah. you know, which kind of allow for the conversation. And of course, hoping that governments have the same steam, yeah. which sometimes they don't, mm. but that keeps me going. The pockets of progress keep me going. What does empowerment mean to you? Noam Denny with her questions. <laughs> and then there was no time to prepare. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, just like <laughs> you, I mean, you're right at the crux just, of, you know, the, 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 the work oof. and you're seeing uh, disempowered people. Yeah. Right. Um, 
Mm. Maybe the, the, to contextualize the question, mm. I should say, when do you feel most mm. empowered? And, 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 yeah. and how does that translate to seeing empowerment yeah. in, in, in women? No, your question was good. Yeah. I, was, I was just like, you go deep. <laughs> I love it though. <laughs> but I realize for me, empowerment means having choice. Ugh. Literally. Okay. <laughs> It's having because you see people who don't have choice and options. Yeah. So if I can come here, drop my sons at school and come here and have this amazing conversation with Nomdeni and then go back and check in on the center and then go do a distribution exercise and then still go have coffee and then tomorrow choose to invest in land and then even choose to speak and pick my outfit. Oh, that's empowerment. Mm. It's choice and it's options. And I think the reason why I think what you push for is beautiful is because you're giving people permission to make their choice. Because yeah. without the economic resource, they cannot make a choice. They have to stay in that triggering dangerous situation. Or they can't dream as big oh, as they, they want dream. to. They can't invest in one of the women who works with us. She's a, she's a, she's a flutist. She plays flute because she has the choice. Now she has the choice to be like, oh, I can even invest in my own flute. Cool, awesome. She didn't have that choice a few years ago but because now she's able to make an economic choice. So that for me is empowerment. And no matter what we say, it comes down to having something in your pocket to give you the choice. And that's why that needs to be also front and center, even in some of the work that we do. Yeah. And those are challenges we had to start accepting. Yeah. That's why we brought in an economic empowerment element. Cause we're like, we could say all this, but at the end of the day, if we give the girls pads and she goes home to a mom who's broke, uh -huh, how are you? Then what happens? So we're making sure their moms and by extension, the dads and all have some kind of economic empowerment um, to make choices, better choices for their children. Mm. So that for me is what empowerment is. It's just the power to make a choice. I'm so glad I wore my glasses for this conversation because so many times I've become teary-eyed. No. And I'm so glad, and like when you're speaking, I'm just like, come back, come back, no. come back, come back, come back. Yeah. That was such a beautiful answer yeah. in, 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 in the sense that it also illuminated for me how, how, how vast the capacity of the work that we're doing is yes. the ability for someone to have a choice yeah. and the autonomy yes. for someone to decide what they want to do today there you go autonomy where they want to yeah. go because a lot of people don't have it they don't they're told you're told what to wear you're told absolutely. where to go absolutely but let's let's give them let's give them the choice because a lot of the time um you know not discounting the decisions men make but women make really good decisions even with with 10 rand or, or 100 shillings They'll make a really good choice. They'll feed their kids somehow, um, and hopefully, eventually, also make a choice about their dreams. Yeah. yeah. So let's put money in their hands. Let's train them on the different ways they can use it. But Lisa gives her a choice, man. Mm. At the very least, yeah. You work, I imagine, around a lot of people in vulnerable spaces and vulnerable uh, posture, right? And I can imagine when you have to come into those environments, um, it's it's one of two things. You either make the decision that I have to stand firm for them or I have to access a level of vulnerability so that they can see themselves reflected in me. Mm. My first question is, what choice do you make between the two when you walk into these environments? And my second question is, when was the last time you were vulnerable? I'm going to say it again. <laughs> Nomdeni, <laughs> with her questions. This is, like, I'm so... I love I, it. I, no. I, I love this conversation I'm saying so that because I actually love the question. You're the people who need to be on, like, mainstream, man. Really good questions. Um, oof. That last one, I need a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the first one, though, I think I like to come as I am. Mm. And, but I also do it... Um, let me put it this way. Whenever I've interacted in, in environments that are not the ones I come from, I try to make it collaborative. So I do it with community gatekeepers mm. and, you know, people who can, because they need to vouch for you so that they know yeah. this person isn't coming to disrupt you. They, they actually mean well. Yeah. So that it's easier to come as yourself. So I come as myself often saying, even though I, I, I don't want to purport that I understand, but I also tell them at some level, we're all women, yeah. we've been through certain similar situations um, and that immediately allows you to kind of relate to them. Um, women's lives can be compromised every day yeah. and that's what makes us equal in this room is Absolutely. that any one of us can walk out there and not make it home yeah no matter who we are no matter what car we drive so i i kind of try to find the commonalities mm. between us because we have that and then alongside the community um 
you know, gatekeepers or some of the social workers who are there. I have a center in one of the more underserved areas in Nairobi um, that has a programs manager who's there every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the office assistant was born and raised there. Yeah. So, and I want to give them agency. And sometimes when we go somewhere, I don't say anything. I introduce them and I say, let them talk. Mm -hmm. They know more than I do. Mm -hmm. I can speak to amplify, because that's what I do. I use my platforms to amplify but the agency is with them because they they have lived the truth. Yeah. So that's what I do. And I actually have this program we call Tandika Leso, which in Swahili translates to set down the leso, which is this beautiful East African cloth. Mm. I grew up at the coast. I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> and what that does is it makes all of us equal because we all sit on the floor. Uh, Doesn't matter. Even when people have come to visit, yeah. you know, country representatives, I'm like, remove your sandals and sit on the floor yeah. and let's be equal. So it's about that. It's about finding commonality and then collaborating with community gatekeepers. Mm. The last time I was vulnerable, <laughs> damn. Hey, wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've been, I think, without going into detail, mm. um, I, there was a public moment that happened to me in 2021 okay. where I was kind of um, as a result of something that happened with somebody I was associated with it was really public and it was really painful mm. um, and even though as Janet as a person I've also not been good at being vulnerable publicly maybe because I've done public work for long so yes. I had to keep it together yes. all the time which can be very detrimental because yes. it's like you're always putting on like hi yes. how are you welcome to very performative <laughs> very performative yeah and I internalized being performative so even when I was struggling I'd be like I'm fine yeah <laughs> like I'm dying inside yeah became a mom that helped a little bit just yes. by being vulnerable and then was dealing with with something that was difficult and mm. I didn't know I was dealing with it um and I was really struggling and so what this has allowed me to do is to be, and even through therapy and all, is just be comfortable with the fact that vulnerability is actually a strength and it's good for you. Absolutely. But it took me a long time to kind of put that in my mind. So I think the last time I was vulnerable was probably last week around my birthday. Mm. Yeah, because I allowed myself for the first time ever to, I went to the coast for my birthday. I was doing some work, mm. but I was also trying to just get in touch with myself. Yes. Because I hadn't had space. Mm. Parental burnout, this burnout, work burnout. I'm like, it, allow yourself two days. Mm. It is not the end of the world. And then I got vulnerable with myself yeah. and, you know, had to come to that place where my emotions were let out, but it was within a safe space. Mm. And it allowed me to just be vulnerable. Yeah. Because I'm like, now you know it's okay to yes. be vulnerable. Yes. So I think that was the last time I was really vulnerable. Um, sometimes I'm vulnerable with my kids because mm. they'll ask questions from left field that I don't see coming. Like, yes. mom, do you cry? Then yes. I start getting teary eyes. Yes, yes, mom, yes. what makes you cry? So once I was asked, like, are you happy? Mm. I'm like, that is a loaded question, it Guru. Is. Let me think about yes. that. Yes. But that was the last time I was vulnerable. So I'm allowing myself to, in a sense, grieve mm. what was, you know, as I, you know, transition into a more like solitary setup mm. in my life or single setup, but it's to just grieve what was and, yes. and the dream that you had yes. and to say it's okay to dream, it's okay to be vulnerable and to grieve it, but it's also okay to use that as a way to process and then kind of find your new normal yeah. and be excited about your new normal. Yes. And I'm really blessed to be, to know people like a lot of the women you've been talking to here yes. who are also very, um, have a lot of wisdom and sometimes I sit with them and one coffee with them empowers me for yes. like the rest of the year mm. so yeah and also being vulnerable with god my my journey with faith has also taken an interesting turn yeah. because now i'm like oh i get it now yeah. it's about a relationship yes. with god oh i get it yes. so, so now it's about going to god and saying like good Listen. morning it's yeah. me again yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know Listen. what i mean <laughs> Did you, do you remember what we spoke about I'm here is my list <laughs> i'm gonna need to move a little quick on that one that's you know? funny i totally get it Very, so, i absolutely get it so even my faith um it's keeping me a bit more focused it's giving me a lot of perspective i i i get that i get it, it it's so i don't know what is happening in the world around um woman gaining autonomy mm -hmm. and making decisions that allow them to figure out who they want to be in the world. There is so much societal pressure 
on women to appear a particular way. And I'm not talking about impoverished women. I'm talking about CEOs. Mm. The, 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 the New Zealand yes, Prime, Prime Minister, Minister yes, resigning yes, yeah. is, is, for me, I, I looked at that and I thought, what does this mean, you know, for the, the conversation and everything and all the work that's being done? And, and, I, and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm realizing that what it means is women seek autonomy in a deep way that we can never understand until you have gone through uh, the, 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 the tunnel of what is expected of you. Mm -hmm. And you have done it so well. You've achieved everything. You're an A student. You, you got the kids. You got married. You ticked all the boxes. Mm -hmm. So you gave the world everything it expected you to, to give it, mm -hmm. but you were never present to give yourself anything. And I think I see it so much with extremely successful women because to navigate success in the world is to define it as the world has told you it is. Mm -hmm. And once you get to a point where you recognize, I actually have the power to do this thing, but now I'm rediscovering that I have a power to do something else. Yeah. And, and, and the feeling of power that comes with that, the ability to say, I am extremely feminine, but I can also take up the masculine when necessary. Yeah. But actually, I don't want to be masculine all the time yeah. because that's just not fundamentally my makeup. Mm -hmm. So I think the way that you've expressed it is so affirming mm -hmm. for myself and many other women who I know uh, watch this podcast who are going through similar transitions mm -hmm. or asking themselves those questions of, is this really it? Right. Is this really it? I've given the world everything. Yeah. I've been a great mom. I've yeah. given the kids. I've, you know, I've been a great makoti. Yeah. You know, I've ticked all the boxes, yeah. but is this really it? Yeah. And is my tank still full? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. Our tanks are running on, a lot of us, a lot of women's tanks are running on empty. Yeah. Or just to your point, first of all, you've captured that so beautifully when you've gone through the tunnel and you've given and you've succeeded. Yeah. But you're still like, there's still something in me that's that's different yeah and an interesting thing about our agency and autonomy is the more that we have the more persecution we'll see mm. and i keep telling people this when i was at the un last year in new york in november a few of us were called there to talk about activism work etc so you have these college students come up to you and be like that was amazing what do i need to do mm. and i remember telling them the first thing you need to do is you need to protect your agency yeah because you're here you're 21 22 and i can tell you're passionate about this and I can tell you that the more progressive and empowered you become, the more of a threat it is to society. Mm. So the biggest thing now is how are we protecting women's autonomy and agency? Because it's been it's been fought a lot. Yeah. Because it's not the norm. It is being fought yes. a lot. Oh, a lot. There is so much underlying resentment. And I keep telling people, there's gonna be a nuclear war, guys. And I keep so people are like, what do we do? I'm like, we're gonna strip it down and go back to dialogue. Like we're gonna do all the unsexy things. We need to actually just talk. We need to talk. Even those guys who want to explode, we're going to have to listen to them. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Because if we don't give them the space to say why it's a threat, yeah. why they are bothered by yes. the, the audacity of our autonomy, yes. if we don't give them that audience, they're going to breed resentment and absolutely. project it in a really bad way. Absolutely. That's so, so powerful. Yeah, we have to protect the that autonomy. That is so powerful. Even of children. Yeah. Children are, have a lot of agency now, and you don't want somebody to be thinking, this one with their mouth. Mm. It needs to be guided. It needs to be molded and encouraged so that you don't end up erasing them or, or diminishing them simply because they had the audacity to ask why. Yeah. So, so agency is, um, is a threat in a very patriarchal world and society. Absolutely. Um, so we need a lot more, I think, gatekeepers of patriarchy, who can be men and women, mm. to kind of know, like, it's not about, it's not, it's not scary. It's beautiful if everybody can express themselves. Yes. You don't have to agree with it, but there is a power dynamic. So, but it's true what you're saying is that it's a beautiful season to be in when you can, before you've even reached, I don't know, 40s or 50s, to say, I want to do different for me. Yes. It's such a gift. Absolutely. You know, it is. Yeah. It, it is. It takes a lot of courage. And if you can access that courage and make yeah. that decision, mm -hmm. uh, the other side is really, really blissful. It really is. It really is. I want uh, my last question. I mean, I could, I could speak to I'm you. I'm not ready to go no more. She's going to have to kick me off set. I can speak to like... you forever. <laughs> like, it's, it's the, the, uh, I, I think the depth of commitment to the work that you have allows for such a illuminating discussion oh, that is 
empowering for people who want to act, yeah. for people who want to do something, right. to kind of figure out, oh, where can I plug in and is it enough? Mm -hmm. I, I can, I can, I can safely say for myself, that's how I feel at the end of this conversation, that mm -hmm. actually all the things that I'm, 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 I have not been able to access because I am not mm -hmm. on the ground, you've given me access to. Mm -hmm. And for you having navigated this beautiful, beautiful journey, yeah. I mean, I don't know a lot about your life, but there is a feeling of, um, see me seeing myself number one in you and in your journey oh, thank you. and um, I want to know what has been life's biggest lesson so far for you um, <laughs> that character development will be met <laughs> like <laughs> that <laughs> premium character development will can shape you um, I, I say it lightly, but it's so true because a lot of things come your way very unexpectedly and you have to pivot. Yeah. And you either spiral or you survive it. Or you bloom. Or you bloom. That's really well said. You either spiral or you bloom. Mm. And it can take one thought process to send you in either direction. Mm. Um, so I've had to learn, as much as it's been said to death, I've had to learn how, what it was meant for which means sitting with it for some time. I've really learned to give myself the space to sit with something, um, which I didn't used to do. I was so, my life has been very fast paced and I yeah. loved it. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what is the next project? Yes. What's the next job? And yeah. I was a breaking news anchor, which meant yes. you run on fumes mm. because at any given time you're having lunch with your family and you're called to studio. Yes. So my life live was on adrenaline and I loved it. Mm. Um, and then suddenly you have to, you have to have conversations with yourself. I did a video about this a few years, two years ago or three years ago. And during COVID, I remember I put my sons to bed at 9 p.m. and I sat down and had an AGM with myself. <laughs> I poured wine and I took a notebook and I said, you're gonna have a conversation with yourself and you're gonna face really ugly truths that maybe you haven't wanted to face. You're gonna have to figure out what your toxic traits are. You're gonna have to figure out how you want to heal. Mm. And that's the greatest thing I ever did. Yeah. So life's lesson has taught me that it's okay to sit with yourself it's not easy yeah and it doesn't mean you have to be hard with yourself yes. I, I tell people i chose a time when i was relaxed and in a good and being kind to myself and with a glass of wine that always helps that always helps <laughs> i haven't had one in a minute i think in like over a year i haven't had a drink in over a year it's a whole other story but i was being kind to myself mm. i was choosing janet coddle yourself in this moment yeah don't deride yourself don't put yourself down. Just have a very honest conversation about yourself. Mm. Like, have an honest come, coming to. Yeah. Why do you have this habit? Why does this pattern persist? Where do you think this is from? And then I was able to, because even in navigating the space I'm in, there was a lot of conflict and fighting. Some people were like, she's doing it for clout. Yeah. She's doing it for likes. Mm. Um, she thinks she's all that. She's an imposter. She's not even doing it for the right reasons or whatever, she's performative yeah. because of the TV thing. And so even if you're making progress, you're fighting a lot of opinions. Yes. And I had to actually ask myself questions like, why are you doing the work you're doing? You could be back on TV. You still have conversations and openings with all these media houses because I've kept, you know, thank God, I've kept really good relationships with them where they're like, if you ever want to have the conversation, let's have it. So why are you doing what you're doing? Mm. Is it for clout? Is it for... And I was like, no, there's no way you can be more broke than you've ever been. <laughs> You're doing something. But that's a, that's a, that's another discussion, right? Yeah. The 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 how the the shift affects your lifestyle yes. and the way that you used to live. And and yeah, yeah I'm not going to start because <laughs> that's and, another and conversation. How, but how we need to pay ourselves? Because one of the ladies I was talking to earlier was like, this is my problem with all you women doing so well is we need to learn how to compensate ourselves, um, which we're moving into. Yeah. Thank goodness. But. Um, so, so life's lesson has been have a meeting with yourself and have a tough one while being loving to yourself. Because yes. then you're able to uncover a lot of truths about your boundaries, yes. about your priorities, even about the people you need to say sorry to. Mm. And whoever owes you an apology, make peace with the fact that you may never get it. That's you may a tough never one. get it. You but may it, never get it. It allows you to just really look at everything holistically. Yeah. And then it allowed me to just be bolder in the way I was moving through life. Mm. Because I was like, I've... You want to call me something? I've already called myself I, that. I, I already know it. I already know it. You want to be like, hey, I'm like, but, but that's also 2020, Janet. Yes. Um, for some reason, you still want to be there. So you can still think that's who she is. Yeah. She's now in 2023. She's evolved. You don't want to hear it, but that's fine. Yeah. So it just allows you to live your truth unapologetically. Um, 
and just also really thrive through your mission. Yeah. But that's the biggest lesson I've learned. And I always tell people, please sit down with yourself. Heal your traumas, my God. You're there thrown for people who will develop your character. Yeah. Give them the gift of healing their traumas. Be like, here is a free pass to yes. therapy. Yes. Here's a resource. Here's a helpline. Yes. You know, whatever it is. Yeah. Have that. Have that moment to be very honest with yourself. It even helps you figure out your finances. Mm. Allows you to thrive. You're like, I can now do the business. Because there's trauma there as well. There's trauma there. There's trauma there yeah. as well. So that's the biggest lesson I learned. And all of it kind of centered me right back to the root, which was my lifestyle is now more of centering God. Mm. It is by no means about me being a holy girl because yes. I have done some very unholy yes. things. Um, but it's about saying that's what I've chosen to do. I have to figure out how to strengthen it, mm. even though it, it doesn't matter. The people in my circle are so broad. I know people who have chosen lifestyles which people would frown upon, but I still love them. Yes. I don't want to force myself onto them and my beliefs. But I was like, then what do you believe in, Janet? You're mm. being swayed here and there. What, what do you believe in? Yeah. And I realized, I think I believe in the faith that I've always followed. I've always been very lukewarm. Mm. And I think I'm still lukewarm, but I'm getting there. Now at least I've asserted that this is what I believe in. It doesn't have to be what she believes in. Yeah. I have friends who've chosen very unorthodox ways of life. Yes. But I still hold space for them. Yeah. Um, don't come to me and be like, you can't be that person. I'm like, I still love. It's cool. Yeah. We'll disagree then we'll move on. Yeah. Um, so that's what it makes you do. It just makes you say, like, I'm going to stand firm in this choice that I've made. Yeah. You may want to judge me. You may want to question it, but it's not harming anyone. Mm. Um, and I'm just going to try and hold space for people and continue to hold space for my healing and thriving um, and allowing myself to enjoy life again. Because for a moment, I wasn't. For a moment, I was really depressed. Yeah. Like, really, really depressed. And I was like, okay. You've done your moping. I, yes. mean, I gave myself time to mope. Yes, oh, yes, yeah, that's did. important. Very important. That's very important. I was like, oh my God. And I'm like, okay, you've moped. Good, good, good. Yeah. My life is horrible. My life is horrible. <laughs> Everything that's happening is the worst. <laughs> then God gives you the privilege to mope yeah. by, a, like, by a beach house. Yes. Ah, I'm like, yes. this is, this like, is uh, a gift. Actually, <laughs> I'm waking up in the beach house. But yeah, right, it's, because, it's, yeah. It's, it's so important. Janet, thank you. I, I, can't, yeah. I can't express my gratitude enough for number one, the work that you do yeah. and how many lives you're impacting now, but also the lives you will impact through these conversations and through this extension of storytelling oh, in itself. I, I had no idea when I came to Nairobi what kind of conversations I'll be having with every person that I'm going to be having a conversation with. And this has been empowering in a way I, I can't express with words, yeah. but I know you will see in, in, in the actions that follow, you know. Oh, My you. privilege is to be able to access minds like yours, you know, through this platform. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think you asked really great questions. Thank so you. Like, oh, well, for the news anchor, I, no. think, I think that's good. I'm like, I'm going to go home and have another meeting with myself because of Numdeni <laughs> saying like, tell me about empowerment oh in life. Gosh. But thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you. welcome to Kenya and welcome again. Yes, we I love will having definitely you here. be back. I yeah. will definitely be back. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Oh,